Okay, welcome everybody. I think we'll get started for the first edition of our 2023 BC Associate Speaker Series. So welcome everybody. I'm happy to have us back with an exciting talk to start the new year off with. And so, I said this meeting is being recorded. So this meeting is really just for the kind of the internal group of BC. It's not for kind of a global audience, which allows it to be more interactive, more opportunity for discussions and um, questions and answers, that kind of thing. Um, we will make a point, though, of although you can unmute yourself at any time, please keep yourself muted until the very end, and then we'll have an opportunity for discussion, uh, discussion and questions at that point. Uh, please also save your questions until the end and put them in the chat box at that point. So because we are kind of an internal group, I will remind everybody that we have an internal website that's just for the BC Associates. Um, that website is there, although technically people who are watching this video elsewhere can see it. Um, there's new, the monthly news that is go by email are there, links to the speaker series, past presentations, any potential social activities can be found on that website as well. I do wanna start off with Indigenous uh, land acknowledgement. So we recognize that many Indigenous nations have long-standing relationships, the territories upon which York University campuses are located that precede the establishment of York University. York University acknowledges its presence on the traditional territory of many Indigenous nations. The area known as Tikaranto has been terror taken by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron Wandat, and the Metis. It is now home to many Indigenous peoples. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, and know that this territory is subject to the Dish with One Spoon Wampan Belt Covenant, an agreement to peacefully share and care for the Great Lakes region. But of course, Indigenous peoples have been on the landscape for millennia, and different people are diff different Indigenous groups have been in the area um, at different times. And so I encourage you to dig into native-land.ca. You can look through there to see who is currently on the land, who um, traditionally had been on the land, uh, for what the region you're living in now, as well as perhaps where you do your field work, uh, where you do research samples from. And that I want to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Trevor Sless. Uh, Trevor was born in Toronto, Canada, where he graduated from the University of Toronto in 2015, receiving his honors Bachelor of Science with double majors in ecology and evolutionary biology, as well as molecular genetics and microbiology. He then attended Cornell University's Ecology and Evolutionary Biology Department as a PhD student until he graduated in April 2022. He returned to Toronto this past summer, where he started his current postdoctoral position in the Rehan Lab here at York University. So thank, thank you, Trevor, and we'll turn it over to you. Great. Thank you very much for that introduction. I'll just get my slides up here. Can everybody see that OK? Yeah, we're good. Thank okay, you. great. Thank you. Um, so yes, thanks very much, Victoria. Um, as mentioned, I am a postdoctoral researcher in the Rian Lab here at York. And, but today, I'm also going to be talking about my, uh, my PhD work that I completed this past year at Cornell University, focusing on the evolution of brood parasitism, uh, mostly in bees, as we'll be talking about. Um, so to give a very quick intro on sort of my research interests in general, I've always really liked the idea of major transitionary events in the history of evolution. And some obvious examples of these include the evolution of endosymbiosis, which of course led to eukaryotes, um, multicellularity, which led to animals in addition to various other groups, and the evolution of terrestriality, which of course was instrumental in uh, our own history as tetrapods, as well as of course the insects, which we all know and love. And while these examples here mostly involve sort of adaptations that are intrinsic to the organisms in question, we can also imagine how uh, transitions in the history of evolution may involve new ways of interacting between species as well. And so, of course, these may include mutualistic interactions, as we see on the left here with these uh, our muscular mycorrhizal fungi, um, or they could include antagonistic interactions like predation or parasitism. And parasitism specifically has been uh, a topic of real interest to me just because of the incredible diversity of strategies and types of interactions that it involves. And so that's what I did most of my PhD work on. In particular, I studied brood parasitism primarily, and I want to just give a brief kind of introduction to how this differs from other forms of exploitation. And what's specifically unique about brood parasitism, in my mind at least, is that it involves the exploitation of parental care behaviors 
um, which often involves the exploitation of food resources, as we can see with this dung beetle over here, um, but it could involve other types of behavior as well, like guarding with this mouth brooding fish. And what's really unique about brood parasitism, in my opinion, is that in contrast to other forms, which all just kind of lump together as trophic parasites, um, brood parasitism does not involve direct consumption of the host organism itself, but instead focuses on exploitation of that organism's uh, essentially efforts or behaviors, or in some cases, collected resources. And I think this is really cool because I like to imagine it as the only form of parasitism that specifically acts on a sort of aspect of the host's extended phenotype rather than just their physical body. And of course, brood parasitism also involves many uh, intimate interactions between host parasites that lend themselves well to these types of uh, co-evolutionary interactions, including arms races and various um, you know, unique and interesting adaptations, such as, as we can see on the right here, two different examples of a species of brood parasite which kill their host nestmates, um, one being a cuckoo bird on the top, and then we also have a larval cuckoo bee down here with these very impressive mandibles that it can use to kill its nestmates as well. So as a general quick overview of my talk, I'm going to be going over three different chapters of my dissertation, which focus on the evolution of brood parasitism across three different evolutionary scales. The first of these will look into brood parasites as a guild of unrelated organisms spread throughout the tree of life. But I'll then be talking more in detail about a particular clade of brood parasitic bees that is near and dear to my heart. And then finally, I'll be looking at a particular species of brood parasitic bee, which I've studied at a genomic level. So starting off with this first chapter, um, I wanted to give, a, again, a little bit of just general background on the research, the body of research that goes into parasitic behaviors in general. And parasites are an incredibly diverse and common group of organisms as a whole. Um, many estimates suggest that as many or that up to one half of all species on Earth might be parasitic in some form or another. Um, and we can see that within animals, this is a very common behavior that's evolved independently uh, at least several hundred times across the animal tree of life. But despite the fact that it is certainly very common, um, there are still some kind of open questions or at least conflicting information on the specific effects that parasitism has on the diversification rates of parasitic clades. What I mean by this um, is that, you know, there, there are sort of conflicting results as to how being a parasite might actually affect the future uh, diversification of your lineage. We can see as an example, this is a study which looked at the relationship between um, species richness of parasitic clades and their closest non-parasitic relatives, and they found no particular pattern or relationship here. However, other studies, such as this one by Jaskova and Weens, found that parasitism is itself a strong explanatory factor um, that went into their, their sort of model of various features that predict animal diversification as a whole. Sorry if you can hear the sirens in the background there. So clearly parasitism is you know, is important and is a contributor to diversity, but the details of how that works are a bit more subtle, let's say. Um, however, a lot of these studies that I've talked about or introduced so far here, specifically either implicitly or explicitly exclude brood parasites for one reason or another. And since that's the main form of parasitism that I'm interested in, um, I wanted to conduct further studies on this particular type of parasitism rather than, you know, these other studies that have primarily not considered it. So my main research questions for this chapter were um, firstly conducting a sort of survey of how many times brood parasitism has evolved within animals. And I then wanted to study the effect that brood parasitism has had, if any, on diversification rate of these lineages that use this strategy. And then finally, I had some question or a final question related to um, the relationships between brood parasites and their host organisms, uh, which I'll discuss in a bit more detail later on. So getting into this first question, um, in order to investigate this, I conducted a comprehensive and systematic literature search of essentially all uh, literature I could find dealing with the topic of brood parasitism and all major groups of animals. And I'm gonna you know, not go into detail on how this worked, but I got to read lots of interesting uh, secondary resources like the ones pictured here, as well as of course, many hundreds of primary research articles too. <clears throat> 
and ultimately distilling you know this many months of work down into a couple of sentences um i identified 59 independent clades of organisms or animals i should say which i consider to be true obligate brood parasites and then proceeded to collect more detailed biological information about each of these for later comparisons and to quickly run you through what some of these are just to show you um, we have a couple cases of brood parasitism in fish, obviously several within birds, including, of course, the cuckoo birds in the top left here that are the most famous example, probably. Uh, several types of brood parasitic beetles, most of which are dung beetles, uh, a good number within the flies as well from a variety of distinct lineages. And then we have a good number of brood parasitic wasps and particularly uh, a very large number of brood parasitic bees, which is uh, of course, exciting to this group. And I just want to highlight here in this phylogeny, which is showing, you know, essentially this is a, a brood parasites view of the animal tree of life. We have all the independent clades that show brood parasitism shown in red with their non-parasitic cystic taxa in black. And the main kind of features I want to highlight here are the fact that despite my best efforts, I was not able to find any cases of true brood parasitism outside of either vertebrates or insects, although there are a few kind of edge cases that kind of come close, but I didn't ultimately end up considering. And then, you know, again, of interest to this audience, particularly, um, I think is the fact that Hymenoptera are really well represented within this tree, making up more than half of the independent origins of brood parasitism, as you can see in this top pie chart, and also something like two thirds of all currently extant brood parasitic animal species uh, fall within the bees and wasps here too, which is kind of neat. They're definitely uh, very well represented here. So that kind of gets into this first question. We know there's, um, you know, by my count, at least 59 independent origins of this behavior, although almost certainly there are more cases as well that just remain to be properly characterized or discovered. And so getting into this next question I wanted to study, um, how might being a brood parasite affect the diversification rate of some of these lineages? So again, to sort of set some expectations here, um, if we consider diversification as a simple balance between speciation and extinction rates, we can imagine a few potential ways that being a brood parasite might affect this, uh, you know, this overall kind of statistic. On the one hand, being a brood parasite might lead to increased speciation rates because um, you know, being able to diversify by spreading onto new hosts or potentially co-diversifying with hosts may serve as a novel axis of reproductive isolation for such a clade. But on the other hand, we can also, of course, consider that any highly specialized organism is going to face somewhat increased extinction risk due to just simple stochastic effects um, because it is you know, highly dependent on that host organism for survival. So we can kind of imagine potential you know, competing factors here where being a brood parasite might affect diversification rate in either direction. Uh, I will mention there is exactly one previous study that has looked into this topic before, uh, which focused on a particular clade of cuckoo birds. And they were able to identify that actually, kind of as I've just alluded to, both speciation and extinction rates were higher within the clade of birds that they were studying. But this overall resulted in a still negative net diversification rate uh, in that case, because the extinction, the effect of the increased extinction rate was greater than the effect of increased speciation rate. So I essentially wanted to conduct a similar kind of study to this, but rather than focusing on one clade, I wanted to see if this would apply as a general pattern across the many different clades of brood parasites that I identified. In order to do this, I conducted, uh, or I started out at least by conducting sort of simple sister group comparisons of species richness between a brood parasitic clade, such as, for example, the honey guides up here and their closest non-parasitic relatives, um, in this case, the woodpeckers. And just looking at, uh, at this stage, the species richness of each of these groups. And when plotting this for all of the different clades that I was considering independently, you can see here I'm showing a similar figure to what I showed kind of at the beginning of this chapter um, with the previous study that was looking at all types of parasites. In this case, it's only the brood parasites. And we can see on the y-axis, I'm showing the species richness of each of these brood parasitic clades with the species richness of its sister group on the x-axis. And the overall picture here, uh, somewhat actually surprisingly, and in contrast to the previous study I mentioned, which found no clear pattern in this relationship for all parasites more generally, I do actually recover um, 
a somewhat significant reduction in species richness as seen in brood parasitic taxa compared to their non-parasitic sister groups. We can see this um, partly because you know the slope of this trend line is significantly reduced from a one-to-one -one relationship. And just generally, by looking at the graph, you can see that many of these points, most of them fall kind of below this one-to-one -one trend line. So generally speaking, most parasitic clades, most brood parasitic clades, I should say, um, are less species rich than their sister clades, which is kind of interesting. I wanted to kind of further explore this and corroborate this with some additional methods as well. And so I also made some attempts to study diversification rate in and of itself, rather than just using species richness as a proxy for this metric. And so again, I conducted a fairly similar analysis, looking at a comparison between two sister groups, um, where I'm considering now, rather than the simple species richness at the present, I'm considering the rate of species formation in terms of a diversification rate, both from the divergence point between these two clades, as well as from the crown ages of each group when those were available. And showing this in a somewhat different format here, we can see that again, this pattern does seem to hold true. There is a clear uh, and significant reduction in diversification rate on average for brood parasitic taxa compared to their non-parasitic relatives. This is, I think, um, you know, it's nice that it corroborates this previous pattern, although again, this was a little bit surprising to me, but um, but still good to see. When looking at crown ages, the overall sort of magnitude of this effect is pretty similar. If you actually just look at the medians here, although in this case, I was not able to find a significant relationship, probably just because the sample size for this, uh, this data set was a lot smaller, since many of the tax I was studying just unfortunately don't have very detailed estimates for crown ages or diversification times. So getting into this kind of second aspect of this chapter, um, it does seem to be the case that there is this pattern of reduced diversification rate and species richness in brood parasites versus their sister groups. And this was, again, not entirely an expected result. There are many potential factors I can consider that would you know, be involved in this. Obviously, I already introduced some potential hypotheticals related to how both extinction rate and speciation rate might be increased. Um, but another factor, which I don't have time to go into in detail, is that this may be confounded a little bit by the sister groups themselves having an increased diversification rate, um, in part due to the innovation of parental care that many of them show. Uh, but I'm not going to go too much further into that. The last aspect of this chapter that I wanted to talk about is this concept of relationships between host and parasite organisms. And in particular, I was inspired by the concept of Emery's rule, which was invented by the entomologist pictured here who was actually primarily studying uh, socially parasitic ants when he came up with this idea. But essentially he suggested that most of the time, these types of parasitic insects, um, you know, in his case, insects are closely related to their host organisms in an evolutionary sense. And although he was mostly considering it at the level of individual species, I wanted to see if this would hold true more at a sort of phylogenetic scale. And we could consider, consider three sort of possible situations here. On the one hand, we can consider the case where um, the hosts of a group of parasites are part of the immediate sister group to that clade. So this would meet Emery's rule in the strict sense, as I would say. We could consider a more sort of subjective, looser sense of Emery's rule, where the host organisms are pretty closely related to the parasites, but not necessarily part of that immediate sister clade. And then, of course, we could consider the third case where the hosts are just, you know, very distantly related um, and essentially have no recent evolutionary shared history with the parasites. And when looking at the distribution of the parasitic taxa that I studied, um, there was sort of an interesting dichotomy here, which is that most of the insect taxa, almost all insects, in fact, for which I was able to have good host data um, to study this, do show that they follow Emery's rule, at least in the looser sense, if not in the stricter sense, meaning that the, you know they are using pretty closely related species as hosts. But this is actually not the case in birds um, or fish, although I'm not picturing them here, which tend to use much more distantly related hosts rather than their close relatives. This was kind of an unexpected result as well that I was a bit surprised to find, but was uh, kind of neat too to see that this rule holds up pretty well for insects, but not so much in other taxa. And my best guess at a sort of very speculative explanation for why this might be the case is that I think there might be sort of a different main driving uh, sort of limiting force in what defines the host ecospace for both of these types of taxa. Whereas within insects, we know that most brood parasites um, 
are, you know, I think likely to be limited by hosts, primarily by host diet and physiology, um, since many of these species are using hosts that are fairly specialized on particular types of food resources. Whereas within the vertebrates, um, I think that the limiting factors are more likely related to sort of cognitive factors and behaviors, since there tends to be much more of an ongoing continuous relationship between uh, the host adult and the parasite offspring uh, as a sort of progressively fed over the course of its life. So there's much more going on there in terms of having to continuously fool a host. So wrapping up this first chapter, um, I think there's a sort of interesting pattern that brood parasites obviously are, are fairly common. They've evolved, well, I wouldn't say common, but they've evolved many times throughout the animal tree of life, but that they're not equally distributed in certain taxa, um, including, of course, bees, as I'll talk about shortly, are much better at evolving brood parasitism than others. And there does seem to be this net reduction in diversification rate in this group, um, which, you know, the exact reasons behind this are still a little bit unclear, but I think it's an interesting result, and especially considering the case that this did not, this pattern was not recovered, but considering all types of parasites more generally. Okay, so wrapping up this first chapter, I'll now be moving in um, to the subject that everybody in the audience wants to hear about, which is bees. And I'll be specifically focusing on my particular favorite group of brood parasitic bees, which is the subfamily Nomadinae. And so this slide is probably unnecessary for most of this audience as well. But um, when considering the topic of major evolutionary transitions or innovations in bees, um, sociality is, I think, the first thing that many people would probably think of. And I certainly don't want to downplay how interesting and unique you sociality is. It's definitely a very cool um, evolutionary event. But I do want to make the case that bees are, in many ways, actually better at being brood parasites than they are at being social. And this is borne out both by the fact that um, there's a higher diversity of brood parasitic bees at the species level than there are social bees, with approximately one out of every eight bee species showing this strategy. And also the strategy of brood parasitism has evolved independently more times within bees than sociality as well, with 20 independent origins represented across four different families, um, as identified in my previous chapter, essentially. But by far, you know, the single kind of standout group here um, is the subfamily Nomadinae within the family Apidae, which is by far the largest and oldest group of brood parasites. So that's what I chose to study for my next chapter. Um, just to very quickly run through the life cycle of what one of these bees looks like, just for interest's sake. As with pretty much any solitary bee, they're born on top of a sort of ball of pollen and nectar um, as a food provision provided by their host. They will then very quickly dispatch their host nestmate and consume these food resources, developing to adulthood as any bee would. And at this point, they can then go about their lives uh, searching for other host nests to infiltrate and repeat this cycle. And I really want to highlight, this, you know, hopefully a few beautiful picture slides here, uh, credits to Lawrence Packer, that the nomadines are very diverse, not only, you know, as you can see, they come in a wide range of shapes and sizes and colors here, but they're also behaviorally diverse too. And in particular, with respect to the host associations of these bees, uh, some of the nomadines are happy to use other members of their family, the apidae, as hosts, but there are also representatives that will use um, bees from other families as well, such as these ones shown here. And if we just consider a kind of snapshot of the current, um, you know, the current diversity that we see in the world, trying to map these relationships between host and parasites gets pretty messy pretty quickly, as you can see. Uh, obviously, it's you know, a bit exaggerated, but really what I'm trying to get at here is that in order to get a, a bigger picture understanding of how these host parasite associations have changed and developed over time, we need, of course, a phylogeny. So getting into my main research questions with this chapter, I sought to construct a phylogeny of the subfamily Nomadinae so that I could investigate uh, the oldest group of brood parasitic bees and learn more about what the very first brood parasitic bees would have been like. And then I was also interested, of course, in studying how those host parasite associations have gone on and developed since that original point where this group uh, first split off from its relatives. So in order to investigate this, I conducted a phylogenetic study taking advantage of taxa sampled from museum and personal collections that originally came from all over the world. I used ultra-conserved elements, which many people here um, are probably at least somewhat familiar with. These are 
uh, essentially just highly conserved regions of the genome that can be sequenced. And you can, you know, as you sort of sequence away from the central core region of this conserved area, you get a nice range of uh, sites that will be phylogenetically informative across a deep range of timescales, um, you know, including going all the way back to the origins of this group approximately 100 million years ago, but also helping you capture more recent diversification as well. And so skimming over the methods, I'll just kind of get into the results of what this tree looked like that I was able to construct. And essentially, the three clades that I'll highlight include uh, the first split between this one tribe, the Melatini, and all the other nomadines over here. There is then another split between this one group, which we call the Aerocrocodine line. It's primarily neotropical in distribution. And finally, the last group here is what we call the Nomadine line, which is essentially uh, what was sort of formerly called the Nomadine sensu stricto, although I'm now using that term in a looser sense. And this group is very diverse, um, more diverse than it is shown here proportionally, and is also cosmopolitan in distribution. So the common ancestor of this group, as I previously mentioned, lived about 100 million years ago. And I wanted to see you know, what we can learn about this common ancestor with respect to its behavior and specifically what types of hosts it may have been using. And in order to do this, I, construct, I conducted ancestral state reconstructions of these host preferences and associations onto the tree. So you can see here, I'm showing the same tree, just kind of rescaled for visibility in a different way, where each of the tips on this tree is color-coded according to which family of host bees that particular parasitic species primarily uses. And again, I'll quickly kind of walk through those three main clades that I highlighted a second ago. If we look at the uh, sort of sister group to the rest of the nomadines, the tribe Melatini, they exclusively use other members of the family Apidae as hosts, and primarily they use uh, members of the digger bees in the subfamily Anthocrinae. Moving into the Aerocrocodine line, we again see that clearly they were ancestrally using other members of Apidae as hosts, but that they, they include um, two clear transition events onto other families of host bees as well. And then when we get into the Nomadon line, kind of all bets are off. There is one major host switching event early in the evolution of this group, and then many, many subsequent host switching events and also reversals later into this clade as well. So clearly um, this group over here is, is you know, undergoing a lot more host switching events than the, uh, the other earlier branching groups of Nomadines. And looking at the common ancestor of this clade, I think it's pretty obvious that they were almost certainly using other members of the family Apidae as hosts, um, which is you know, nice to be able to reconstruct that pretty clear pattern here as well. To very quickly revisit Emery's rules I mentioned in the last chapter, which suggests, you know, again, these close relationships between hosts and parasites. Um, we have this kind of cool story here where when considering the uh, the ancestral state of this group, it does seem to be the case that they were following Emery's rule and that they initially parasitized close relatives. Um, not entirely clear whether it was their sort of immediate sister group or maybe sort of a looser sense of Emery's rule, but in some sense they were definitely using close relatives. Um, and that then, you know, as, the, as this group later diversified and evolved over the subsequent 100 million years, they gained the ability to use a much wider and more diverse range of hosts as well, which is kind of an interesting take on this. And we wouldn't be able to notice, um, you know, the story about Emery's rule if we had only been considering sort of present state of things. So then getting into the second part of this, uh, of this chapter of how these host parasite associations have changed over time from that ancestral state, as I mentioned. There's another aspect of the diversity of these bees, which I haven't introduced yet, which is that there's a sort of interesting dichotomy in two major parasitic strategies or modes of parasitism, as we call them, uh, that is shown by different species. Some of the nomadine bees use what we call closed cell parasitism, where they'll essentially find a host nest that has been sealed off and completed, and then break into that uh, and lay their own eggs as follows. Sorry, I had a little animation there. Let's see if I can, yeah, it's not gonna work, that's okay. Um, what is anyway, they're breaking into a completed nest as shown here. And in contrast, we can also imagine that many of these bees use what we call an open cell parasitism strategy where they're infiltrating a nest that is still under construction or being provisioned. And so in doing this, they have to be a fair bit more sneaky because they have a chance of actually interacting with their host in this way. 
And so just as I showed previously with the host parasite associations, we can also map the, um, the evolutionary history of these two different parasitic strategies onto this tree as follows. And this is fortunately a fair bit simpler to interpret. And again, going through these major clades on the left here, we have the tribe Melacchini, which shows entirely closed cell parasites, nothing particularly interesting going on there. Within the Aerocrocody mine, um, again, they're clearly ancestrally closed cell parasites, but we have one large shift to open cell parasitism that occurs later in the tree. And interestingly, this is quite close, being only about one node away from a major host shift event as well. And then into the nomad, uh, sorry, nomadan mine, we again see a major shift from closed cell to open cell parasitism quite early in their development, which is never reversed um, over evolutionary time either. So putting these two kind of mapping or ancestral state mappings side by side, um, obviously don't worry too much about the details of this figure. But what I think is really interesting is we can see that going from, uh, you know, there's an interesting interaction between the host associations and the mode of parasitism in that this earliest branching group, the tribe Melacchini, shows fairly low diversity of closely related hosts that they're exploiting, and they're all closed cell parasites, and that's kind of the end of the story. But within the Aerocrocody lines here, there are some host switching events, but these only occur after the transition from closed cell to open cell parasitism that occurred in this tree. And then getting down to the nomadine line, it seems to be the case that this very early transition um, into this new open cell mode of parasitism may have facilitated the incredible array of subsequent host switching events that these uh, that these bees have experienced over their evolution as well. So this is kind of a neat story here. Um, the, the exact question of why these open cell parasites are somewhat less host restricted, which seems to be the case since they're more evolutionary flexible and able to switch onto much more distantly related hosts is a little bit unclear, but I can have some, you know, if I may speculate a little bit, my best guesses are that it could be the case that these open cell parasites, um, because the strategy is relatively quick and simple, may be able to, uh, you know, more easily exploit or make attempts to exploit more distantly related hosts or suboptimal hosts, because it just simply takes less time for them to investigate a nest. Or it could be the case that some of the more complicated defense structures, be they chemical or physical defenses that other groups of bees use, such as the polluted bee represented here, um, are more easily circumvented by an open cell parasite. Whereas once this nest is sort of completed and sealed off, it might just be completely unavailable to a closed cell parasite to uh, be able to use. So wrapping up this second chapter, I think there's kind of a really neat story here that really highlights the importance of using good phylogenetic studies for learning about these kind of traits. Um, we can see that this oldest group of brood parasitic bees uh, about 100 million years ago evolved this strategy and that they were initially using closely related species as hosts, but eventually diversified onto a much wider array of host bees. Um, and that it seems to be the case that this expansion onto a much wider range of hosts was facilitated by novel behaviors and new modes of parasitism that allowed them to exploit these different types of bees. Okay, moving into my third chapter, I'll now be zooming in even further on one particular species within this tree, which is uh, a, a species that is a personal favorite of mine, Holcopocytes caleopsidus, as pictured here. And I'm going to be changing gears a little bit again um, in terms of the methodology, because as I've been talking about before, mostly sort of phylogenetic and evolutionary uh, questions. I'm now going to be focusing on the genome of this species and what we can learn about the sort of genomic signatures of being a root parasite. So to paint you a sort of quick background picture of the current state of genomic research in bees as a whole, um, overall, about a quarter of a percent of every currently living bee species has a sequenced genome available. And that might not sound like much, but that's actually pretty good as insects go. If you compare with any sort of similarly sized plate of insects, that's probably better representation than you would have for most of them. But this representation is definitely not equally distributed when it comes to representing the diverse array of lifestyles seen by these bees. As you can see here, most of these currently available genomes that are published on GenBank are representing social species. Um, you know, obviously the honeybees and bumblebees get a lot of attention here. And at least at the time that I was working on this project at first, there were no brood parasitic genomes available. So I wanted to change that and sequence the first one or the first representative of this you know, decent chunk of bee diversity. And of course, going into any genome project, it is always good to have some you know, expectations set up in advance. 
Um, and one of the things that I was able to predict just by you know reading up on the evolution of, of genomes of other types of parasitic animals is that there's a pretty clear and consistent pattern of reduced genome size in parasitic organisms versus their non-parasitic relatives across animals pretty generally. You can see that this is the case, you know, these are several different groups of invertebrate animals here, most of which do show this pattern. And it's in fact already been shown in certain hymenoptera, mostly focusing on the parasitoid wasps, you know, your ichneumonids and burconid wasps, um, that this pattern also holds true in those cases too. And so I wanted to see, does this, you know, very, very broad scale pattern, um, is this also followed in a breed parasitic bee? The general kind of rationale behind this idea is that being a parasite allows for sort of relaxed selection on certain types of genes or certain portions of the genome which are no longer needed. So for a sort of typical trophic parasite or an internal parasite, we might imagine, for example, that this includes offloading of metabolic genes from the parasite to the host. So we can see here, this is just a depiction of various metabolic processes, which in several different types of parasitic worms, um, certain genes involved in these processes have been entirely lost. Because of course, if you're you know, an internal parasite that lives inside a host organism, you're getting all this nice, complete nutrition readily available for you. And you don't need to do nearly as much metabolism to synthesize some more complex nutrients uh, anymore. And so brood parasites don't have the luxury of being able to offload any metabolic concerns. But we might imagine that they could potentially be offloading behavioral aspects of their genome, um, such as any genes that are involved in the you know, foraging for pollen and nectar or constructing and provisioning a nest since they no longer engage in these behaviors. In addition to, as I just mentioned, um, you know, the, the, the loss of genes involved in these behaviors, we can also think of potential adapt or potential genic, uh, sorry, genomic bases for associated or other adaptations, including the loss of physical structures related to pollen collection, as well as both defensive and offensive adaptations for interacting with hosts, such as a thicker cuticle to protect against host stings, and these very large mandibles, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, um, which are involved in killing the host messmates in the larval stage. Um, but of course, as previously mentioned, it seems like a lot of the changes we're going to see are probably not going to be immediately visible like this and are more going to be related to behavioral and potentially sensory differences um, in the world that is experienced by brood parasites, which differs a lot in these ways from its hosts. Okay, and just a very quick intro to the species that I chose to study for this. Um, I was already working on Hocopocytes caleopsidus for a totally unrelated project, which didn't even make it into my thesis anyway. Um, so that's why I chose to sequence the genome of this species. And all you really need to know is that it's a pretty typical brood parasitic bee that at least in this part of the sort of northeastern North America um, appears to be highly specialized on a single host species, the mining bee Caleopsis andriniformis, as pictured here. So my main research questions for this, uh, this third chapter of my dissertation were focused on, firstly, the comparison of parasite to parasite. Does this you know, brood parasitic genomes show similar overall patterns to other types of animal parasites as well? And then, of course, we also want to compare from bee to bee. How does a parasitic uh, genome of one bee compare to other previously sequenced free living bees that are available? Okay, so again, I'm going to gloss over the methods here a lot of, uh, and not spend any time on this really, but essentially I just sequenced the genome of a single male individual of this species using the PacBio hi fi pipeline and conducted various downstream analyses to annotate and uh, further analyze the genome. So starting off with the first and most straightforward result, um, we were able to find very clearly that this genome does show a small size in contrast to all other bee genomes. And in fact, as of the time of, as I'm presenting this right now, it does still seem to be the smallest known bee genome currently sequenced to date. Um, so that's cool. And it does match with this previously existing pattern of reduced genome size in parasites compared to non-parasitic relatives. But of course, the question then arises as, you know, what actually accounts for this genome size reduction? What has been lost from the genome to explain this? 
The first thing to rule out here was any methodological artifacts or things like that. Um, but I was able to show by being able to detect over 97% of these highly conserved universal single copy orthologs or buscos as they're called, that this genome assembly was pretty complete. So there doesn't seem to be any reason to expect that any of this small genome size is explained by just missing data. So that's you know reassuring at least. And the next thing I considered was repetitive content, because if you're familiar with any literature on the evolution of genome size in particular, um, repetitive elements and repetitive content in general is often cited as one of the clearest explanations for rapid expansions and contractions in genome size. However, repetitive sequences do not seem to be able to account for the small genome of Hocopocytes caliopsidus, because as we can see here, it turns out that a, actually a pretty large percent of the genome is still repetitive in this species. And in fact, over, well, nearly twice as much of the genome, proportionally speaking, consists of repetitive content versus something like a honeybee, as you can see here. And I also want to particularly highlight the fact that um, most of the repetitive content in this genome falls into this just sort of unclassified category, meaning that it is repetitive sequence, which you know, occurs many times throughout the genome, but does not match with any previously known libraries of repetitive sequence data as extracted from previous species that have been studied before. So it could be the case that a lot of this is basically novel repetitive sequence data that does not exist in other taxa. Although this isn't totally unprecedented because there was a similar finding in another recently published genome, uh, that of Kalidis gigas, which also has a lot of unclassified repetitive data. Just gonna take a drink of water here. So having ruled out um, a purging of repetitive content as the explanation for the small genome size of Holcopocytes, I further sought to obviously look at the genes themselves and see if there's any reduction there. And using a combination of different annotation pipelines, I ultimately identified about 12,300 putative genes within this genome. And somewhat surprisingly, yet again, this falls pretty close in line to uh, the average number of genes seen in other bees, of which I've selected a handful here for comparison. So, uh, you know, again, this was a bit surprising because I was expecting to see a reduction in genetic content compared to other bees, but really it does seem to be the case that overall there's a pretty similar number of genes in there, and this does not in and of itself explain the reduction in genome size um, as, you know, a, a clear purging of genes or anything like that. Although there is some subtlety there, which we'll talk about in a second. So getting into this comparison, um, in comparing with other types of parasites, it does seem to be the case that we follow this at least very broad, like, you know, 30,000 foot view pattern of reduced genome size, which is interesting, although the exact reasons for that are still kind of unclear. But then I wanted to compare the genome of Hocopocytes more specifically with other types of non-parasitic bees and see what differences there are. In order to do that, I conducted an orthology analysis as shown here. What I'm showing is a phylogeny of Hocopocytes down at the bottom, along with several other hymenopteran genomes, Androsophila as an outgroup. And the numbers at each of the nodes of this tree represent the number of orthogroups or essentially gene families that are conserved at that phylogenetic scale. And obviously, to nobody's surprise, um, more than half of the genes within whole societies are conserved at this very high level of sort of insects or above. Nothing about that is surprising. There are many just basic housekeeping genes in there, of course. Uh, but what's more interesting to me is that at the other end of this phylogeny down here, there are 108 orthogroups containing just over 300 individual genes that appear to be unique to Holcopocytes caliopsidus. Although I should say there's a bit of a caveat there that you know, they may be unique to the species, the genus, the tribe, or the subfamily, nomadinae, essentially, because at the time that I was doing this analysis, I only had that one species as a representative of all parasitic nomadines. Further looking into this, we can see that there is a lot of dynamic evolution going on in Holcopocytes as well. So this paints a picture that, you know, although the total number of genes does seem to be pretty conserved in comparison with other bee species, this is not the result of simple stasis. There's actually a lot of going on in there. We can see that Holcopocytes shows more than any of the other species included in this analysis, a lot of gene families that have experienced probably relatively recent contractions 
meaning that these are gene families which in other species might include um, you know many sometimes even dozens of paralogs throughout the genome but in whole societies they're greatly reduced and conversely we also see a very small number of expansions too however this is a little bit misleading since I should mention that although the total number of gene families experiencing contractions is large the total number of genes is still pretty much conserved as already mentioned because a small number of these expansions here are actually very, very significant expansions um, of particular genes that have expanded up to you know, many, many hundreds of copies in some cases throughout the genome. And so the net conservation of genes, uh, so the net number of genes is still conserved, even though there's all this really rapid uh, and probably somewhat recent dynamic evolution or not. Um, so in order to investigate this further, just quickly going back to this slide, I wanted to further characterize these sort of unique Holcoposite specific genes. And so I conducted some functional analyses on these in the last uh, uh, part of this chapter that I'll present, looking into what um, go terms among those Holcoposite specific genes seem to be enriched in contrast to the rest of the genome. And this is where I think, you know, this was an unexpected finding, but kind of tied everything together into a, a, a bit of a nice little story. I was able to find several GO terms that are enriched among these whole study specific genes for both endonuclease activity. And then the real smoking gun was these DNA integration and transposition terms. So what this implies is that there's been a relatively rapid and recent expansion of repetitive elements within the whole Copacetti genome, which if you remember when I talked about repetitive elements earlier, this neatly also explains this large class of just uncharacterized and potentially novel repetitive elements too. And so what seems to be the case is that this species includes a large, uh, a large portion of its genome that's made up of either retroviral or other types of retrotransposable elements that are basically themselves containing genes used to cut and paste themselves throughout the genome fairly freely. So it remains to be seen whether this is a feature that is truly unique to homocopocytes or whether this is true across other novodine species as well. Um, but that's essentially the next major step of this project is further investigating this uh, you know, the, the concept of brood parasitic genomes and unique signatures of brood parasitism in genomes across multiple different types of brood parasitic species. So this is an ongoing project that will be conducted in the coming years, um, as there are many ongoing efforts currently underway um, as we speak that are sequencing these other species of interest as well. So wrapping up this chapter, it's unfortunately a bit of an inconclusive ending here in that although we do match this kind of big picture pattern of parasitic um, of twins in the genome evolution of parasites, the comparison of Holcoposites to other types of bees is still a little bit fuzzy. We don't really know what has been lost from the genome in terms of different types of genes. And you know, I didn't talk about it in detail, but the, the those contracted gene families are, are really just from kind of a, a broad mix of things. There's no particular um, thing that stands out or is clearly associated with brood parasitism. But there was this kind of surprising but interesting finding of this potential uh, you know, recently expanded class of repetitive elements as well. And so I'll just do a very, very quick summary of my whole presentation here. In my first chapter, studying animal brood parasitism as a whole, I found that this strategy has evolved independently dozens of times, well over 50 times throughout the tree of life, and that there is a fairly consistent pattern of reduced diversification rates and species richness in brood parasitic taxa compared to their sister groups, although again, this could be due to a sort of combination of different factors. Um, and also I found that it's clearly the case that you know, not all brood parasitic taxa are equal and the taxonomic background that a brood parasite evolves from does have some effect as to the specifics of its evolutionary strategy. Sorry, um, looking at my second chapter, the subfamily Nematinae, which again is the largest and oldest group of brood parasitic bees. I found this interesting story that early in their evolution over 100 million 100 million years ago, they primarily used closely related host bees um, to parasitize, but then diversified onto a much wider range of hosts over the subsequent uh, millions of years of their evolution. And I think it's the case that this um, transitions onto these more distantly related hosts were probably facilitated by the evolution of these new behaviors, as previously mentioned. And then finally, talking about this genome, we see that the genome of the first brood parasitic bee to be characterized, Holcoposites caliopsidus, um, does show a size reduction, which is in some sense consistent with broad patterns of animal parasites in general, although the specifics of that remain to be further explored. Um, and the exact nature of what has been 
you know, sort of reduced from the genome is still a little bit of an open question that's been difficult to study. But, you know, I found this kind of surprising alternate um, um, discovery that there seems to be this rapidly acting uh, retrotransposon or retroviral element at play within the genome too, which is always uh, interesting to see. I don't have any reason to believe this has anything to do with food parasitism specifically at this time, but it would be cool to see if that's the case across other species as well, which I'm planning to eventually study. So just wrapping up my PhD work, I also wanted to just very quickly highlight what my current work in the Rheum lab is focusing on. Um, I'm involved in an ongoing project to continue studying the subfamily Nomadini, those um, my favorite group of parasitic bees, in particular with respect to their biogeography. I'm also working on the social evolution of the carpenter bee subfamily, Zadokopane, and working on sort of updating this uh, previous study with some newer methods. And finally, I'm working on various projects involving the study of the uh, characterizing the microbiotal or sorry the microbiome diversity of bacteria and fungi associated with various wild bee species found right here in the state of Toronto. Uh, so with that I will say uh, many acknowledgments and thanks to my collaborators, my funding sources, my PhD advisors, and the Rian Lab here at York. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Trevor. So much information. Uh, congratulations Thanks. for condensing your PhD into, you know, 45 you. minutes of, of work. <laughs> um, yeah, so much information. Interesting. I never realized how much you know, parasitism or well, a, how much parasitism was, was out there and how often it originally, you said like almost 60 times. Mm -hmm. That's interesting how evolution works. Yeah. Um, yeah, so people jump in with your questions. I see one in the chat already from Jesse, but anyone else, feel free sure. to turn on your videos on and you're, unmute yourself. Um, you can raise a virtual hand or if you have a camera on a visual hand and we'll go from there. Are you okay reading from the chat, Trevor? Do you want me to read? Yep. Yeah, I can just do that. Okay. Uh, sure, so Jesse has asked, um, do I think that including facultative brood parasites would change things in terms of residual number of independent origins? Um, and other insights. And yes, you, you sound like one of my reviewers, actually. Um, that was definitely a question that I considered um, in a lot of detail when doing this project. I did collect a fair bit of data on facultative breed parasites as well, but ultimately chose not to include it just because it was, frankly, just much messier and much harder to kind of define the boundaries of what is a facultative breed parasite or not. Um, from the Emory Zero perspective, that. I think follows the same general pattern. There are, you know, there are facultatively brood parasitic birds, for example, which are using some of them use close relatives, some don't. Um, within insects, though, I would say that again, it follows typically the pattern that most insects do obey Emery's rule, that even the facultative brood parasites within insects, probably even more so, because within insects, a lot of the facultative brood parasitism we see is actually intraspecific brood parasitism, really. Um, and so obviously in that sense, they're, they're, you know, clearly showing kind of the, the hypothetical situation, which Emery's rule is presenting, which is that, you know, potentially these obligate brood parasites are evolving from facultative brood parasites that are actually acting on other members of their own species. Although that's, you know, there, there's some complicated dynamics there, but definitely, um, yeah, the facultative brood parasites in terms of number of origins. That's a much more complicated question. There are there are probably many, many more groups that could be considered facultatively brood parasitic than obligately, but it it's also just a question of like, yeah, many of them are just simply not well studied enough to know for sure. But yeah, good question. Definitely. Thanks. Uh, I see Jason has his hand up. Jason, you can jump in there if you want, or you just raise your hand. Maybe oh, his question was answered. Oh. I'm unmuting, but I can't put my camera on. Sure. Um, oh, sorry. sorry. It, no worries. It was just a, a quick question because I have to run to a meeting. But mm -hmm. I remember there being, um, you know, a, an idea that brood parasites were like using the male genome part of their mm -hmm. genome. Do you, does the sort of like studies that you've done suggest that that still could be an option, or do you think that's like not true? Yeah, that's um, Bill Whistle's work, I, I guess you're talking about, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I have certainly read that and I'm familiar with it. And I didn't really do any detailed analysis into that kind of thing yet. Um, that is something I think would be interesting to study once we have a few more genomes to compare with. But yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's potentially the case that there are some, there are some aspects of root parasitism in some ways, which 
you know, as the hypothesis goes, resemble sort of male behavior in terms of the way that they're seeking out these nests and everything. And yeah, I mean, it could very well be the case that we see, you know, more evolution or, or rapid evolution within these types of genes um, that would be involved in that. So I'd expect that to be, you know, sensory related genes, um, probably related to like olfaction and things like that. Um, but yeah, no, I, I haven't really done any detailed analysis of that myself, although certainly I think would be cool for future work. Yeah. Thanks. Oh, and then uh, Ben has a question in the chat as well. Um, what was the reason for using pack biosequencing? Um, yeah, I mean, basically, I actually made an, an initial attempt to sequence that same genome uh, several years earlier using Illumina, and it just kind of ended up, it was it was kind of just garbage, honestly, which was uh, disheartening. Um, I, I tried to do some stuff with it, and I just like couldn't get a good assembly out of it at all. Um, you know, maybe that was just I don't know, a, a fluke of that particular case. But yeah, eventually we, we waited a bit. We decided to try back bio. Um, and it obviously is a bit more expensive than some of the methods um, like Illumina. But ultimately, I was I was very happy with the result. Um, in particular, we used, yeah, we got, you know, nice read lengths. We used specifically the um, uh, the high five method with circular consensus sequencing. So you get these really nice, like extremely high uh, fidelity reads since you're repeatedly sequencing the same molecule over and over again. Um, and yeah, I mean, in that sense, it, it, it seemed to be the case. It, it is a bit more expensive, but it's not prohibitively expensive, like some of the super long read methods. Um, and I think seemed to be a good balance and, and certainly was, you know, resulted in a pretty good assembly from my point of view. So I'm happy with it. Uh, and sorry, and then also what difference you see between brute and social parasites? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, which again, <laughs> sounds like some of my reviewers. Um, obviously, I think the the line between brood parasitism and social parasitism is kind of blurry, for sure. Um, there are individual taxa, I mean, within bees, like, you know, some of the sweat bees, Ficotes, for example, kind of actually can act as either a brood or social parasite in some ways, because um, some of them will actually parasitize, you know, social nests of lazy blossom and stuff like that. Um, and so there are a lot of similarities, but yeah, I mean, to be honest, in many ways, the reasoning for my focusing on brute parasitism over social parasitism was somewhat kind of, you know, methodological because there actually had already been some recent work on social parasites, some recent review papers on social parasites, um, which I didn't want to sort of be seen as, as you know, just copying or, or, or duplicating. Um, so that was a part of the reason there, but definitely, yeah, I mean, group parasitism and social parasitism, I think are closely related, uh, behaviors that have a lot of similarities. Cool. Um, okay. Any other questions? And feel free to put in the chat or just unmute yourself and ask. Yeah. Catherine was saying awesome talk and then Benjamin saying great talk. Thank you. I think we could all, all agree <laughs> on that. Thanks. The last call for questions. I could ask another one. <laughs> I have lots of others to be honest. But sure, go ahead. We're in the same lab. So uh, um <laughs> yeah, so I, I know they've done estimates for parasitoid wasps of how like how many actually exist just by mm -hmm. looking at the rates of discovery and then also the number of hosts. Has anything yep. been conducted similar? Like, do we actually think there's way, way more undiscovered, or do mm -hmm. we have a sense of we're reaching saturation, or at least that where the rate of discovery is now the same, or anything like that? Or it's not directly related to the research. Product. That's a good question. Yeah, I mean, it's worth. I could talk about this for a long time, which I, I won't. But to give a quick answer, I think um, yeah, there are some considerations with respect to how brood parasites are identified, and you know, part of the reason. Like my my analysis of root parasitic taxa was as you know agnostic to taxonomic bias as possible, right? Like obviously I know bees and I like bees, but it really didn't seem to be the case that bees just came out as having more root parasites than any other clade that I could find. A large part of that reason is because you know because there are clear morphological signatures of root parasitism in bees, which allow for the identification of a parasitic bee even just from like a pin specimen. Um, whereas in most other taxa, it requires actual like behavioral observation, you know, in the wild, presumably to know for sure that something is a brood parasite. And so a lot of the discovery of brood parasites probably hinges on basically just like actual ecological information and going out and like observing things basically. 
which uh, you know for many taxa is is obviously not done as much as it maybe should be. And so in that sense, I do expect that there are definitely more groups of brood parasites that are unknown, probably from other types of insects. You know, the the beetles and flies really stood out as the cases I found were pretty clear, but there are obviously I think other cases to be expected that just haven't been properly documented yet. Um, and probably others as well. Like if you know, if I were a betting person, I would definitely bet that there are brood parasitic. Uh, probably some brood parasitic arachnids and crustaceans that exist out there, despite my inability to find any that met my definition, um, and that they just haven't been studied. So, yeah, I, I think, you know, I, I can't say anything about like the exact number or anything or like rare rarefaction curves. I haven't really looked into that, but definitely I think there is a good amount of undiscovered diversity of brood parasites out there too. Yeah. Great. All righty. Well, Jesse, some more questions. You can track you down in the lab and, and you guys okay. have more discussions. <laughs> Sounds good. And that's what I'd like to Thanks tie so into um, to my first slide here. As you can track you down at our social, um, we're having a BC social on Thursday, February 9th. So just under a month away uh, for two to four o'clock. So in HNES, so the uh, Environmental and Urban Change Faculty sort of main building. Um, it's, in that, it's kind of a lecture hall classroom setting, but there's access to a kitchenette just down the hallway. So there's a fridge and microwave and a sink. Uh, so it's an opportunity to get together, have some snacks, might do some activities. You can quiz each other about your research or ask what the latest you know, TV show you're streaming. Um, so hope I'll send around a survey the next couple of days just to sort of get people to sign up, express interest and see if there's ideas of what activities you want to do. And the next sort of BC event right after that is next month, February 17th, the next talk in our series by Tom on Furco, um, the effect of dune stabilization on bees and ahulate wasps in the southern Canadian prairies. Um, so you can check uh, the website for the abstract, as you also can see here. And just a reminder again, every month we have another talk. So that same link you use today to join in is the same link you works for each month. So hope to see you back for all the different talks coming forwards. And yeah. Keep on studying bees, everyone. <laughs>